Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to welcome you to the seventh monitor side chat in our series of Tufts Entrepreneurs Tackle Tufts Questions. This event is being put on by the Tufts Entrepreneurs Network, 10, a part of the Tufts Entrepreneurship Center in partnership with the Office of Alumni Relations and the Black Alumni Association. For those of you who don't know what Tufts Entrepreneurs Network is, this group serves as a resource for alumni in the technology and startup spaces, it helps alumni transition from the corporate world into the technology and startup space, and is a resource for the university and the Tufts Entrepreneurship Center. I'd like to say thank you to our extended 10 and TEC team, Mark Kesson, Iggy Molliver, Brittany Sokoloff, Josh Goldman, Kevin Oye, Josh Kappelman, Amy McDonald, and Luke Frazier, as well as our panelists today. We'll have an open 20 minute period at the end of our session for questions, but feel free to submit those along the way using the QA box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll do our best to get to all of them before we close for the evening. My name is Shelby Schultz and I'm an alumna from the class of 2012 and a member of the 10 national chapter, as well as the Austin alumni chair. I'm part of 10 because I'm inspired by the entrepreneurial problem solving spirit present in Tufts students. And I believe it's important that we continue to foster this tenacity and learn from our great network. Today's panel, Success Stories, Black Tufts Alumni and Entrepreneurship and Technology, will highlight the stories of four inspiring Black Tufts alumni who will share how their experience and identity has shaped their success in the Technology and Entrepreneurship Center. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kofi Asante, Timmy Dayo Coyote, Akua Okunsende, and Gozi Uzoma. Kofi, you want to kick us off? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Shelby. Like you said, my name is Kofi Asante, and I'm the head of strategy and business development at El Air. Previously to um, hopping over to El Air, I spent some time over at Uber, helping launch a division that's now called Uber Freight. Before I had an opportunity to join uh, Uber Freight, I spent my time at Tufts um, and graduated in 2017. My major is, was political science and then ended up focusing on entrepreneurial leadership as my minor. Um, and I think there are a couple other things that we'll be able to touch base on throughout the, throughout the conversation. But one of the main things that I really wanted to highlight throughout that string of time um, was how much I ended up enjoying my time at Tufts and how many portions of that actually ended up allowing me to be able to do a lot of the things that I'm doing right now. From the liberal arts connection of being able to think critically around points that don't necessarily connect from one spot to the other, um, it's really enabled me to be able to do a lot of the things that I did at Uber. And then now at El Royer, where we're actually building an autonomous drone that's about 1,300 pounds that can deliver 300 pounds of cargo over 300 miles. Awesome. Timmy, you want to say hello next? Sure thing. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Timmy. Uh, I graduated from Tufts actually a couple of weeks ago, uh, studied economics and computer science, um, and I'm now running my startup work since full time. Uh, I've essentially spent most of my time at Tufts building companies uh, since around the DEI uh, problem within tech. And for those who don't know, DEI refers to essentially diversity, equity, and inclusion. I uh, spent most of my time essentially engaging in, uh, with that topic, thinking about ways to leverage technology to drive fairness, equity, diversity, and inclusion in tech at scale. Um, and now with my company WorkSense, essentially what we're building is software that empowers uh, people leaders at tech companies, whether it's CHROs, chief officers, heads of people, and so on, empowering these individuals to track and mitigate uh, unfair biases in employee compensation and promotion decisions at scale. Uh, spent my time at Tufts, besides entrepreneurship, also sort of embedded in the world of venture capital. Uh, so I spent about two and a half years uh, at Tufts as a venture partner with Contra Capital, which is a $30 million university focused fund. Uh, so I time with them helping to source deals, evaluate deals, um, support entrepreneurs um, within the Tufts ecosystem and the larger Boston area. Um, and that's pretty much uh, my background. And I think in terms of uh, the contribution of Tufts to my entrepreneur journey, I think like when I think back to uh, my time at Tufts, I remember my first semester where I took this entrepreneurship class and we got to visit Mass Challenge. And I think going to the Mass Challenge office and seeing entrepreneurs and getting to talk to one of the entrepreneurs for me is what lit that bug uh, or, or that fire that continues to burn strongly within me till today. Um, and so really appreciative of, uh, of Tufts', uh, Tufts role in kickstarting what I, what I hope will be a very fulfilling and exciting career. Awesome, Akua, you wanna go next? Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Akua Okunsende, class of 2006. 
um, where I majored in economics, minored in political science. I, um, after Tufts, moved to New York and spent three years at Bank of America, so selling foreign exchange uh, to institutional hedge funds. Um, I kind of quickly learned that finance wasn't really my thing, and during that time, um, decided to apply to business school. I was really fortunate to be accepted to Columbia, so spent two years at Columbia learning everything and just trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do next. Um, really landed on the marketing and entrepreneurship track and ended up at American Express for four years after B school and had um, a friend who sort of introduced me to another friend at Google. Um, and so I you know, took a chance and decided to sort of venture into the tech space and ended up at Google where I've been for the past five and a half years working um, both in New York and the London offices. So it's been a really great experience um, and has really been you know, an option for me to be able to dive deep into the tech space. Um, three years ago, I also decided to start a skincare line with my sisters. Uh, one of my sisters is a dermatologist and um, wanted to start a line, and so I, I kind of helped her build that out. Uh, so it's called Carite, and it's a shea butter-based skincare line where we source ingredients from Ghana. Um, so I've really been able to sort of, um, you know, really lead in two different ways in terms of like having a tech, you know, career, but then also having the side hustle in um, in the entrepreneurial realm. And I think. Um, thinking back to Tufts, I was actually taking some of the entrepreneurial leadership courses back in my junior year when the program first launched, and that really got me excited about um, entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, all that time just kind of keeping that entrepreneurial bug and thinking back to those classes has really kind of led me to where I am today. So excited to be here. Awesome. Last but not least, Guzzi. Oh. Hi, um, everyone. I'm Gazi Uzoma. I graduated from Tufts in 2010. Um, I majored in biology and minored in studio art. Um, and I'm currently a product manager at Fox um, Enterprise SaaS organization and kind of took a long road to get to where I am now. But um, right after Tufts, um, worked in teaching, did Teach for America in Baltimore, ended up trying to think about how I could scale my skills more and actually work for a national charter school network after that more on the business side, um, was getting more into technology and decided to go to business school um, and went to University of Chicago, Booth School of Business, and then ended up at Box through a rotational leadership program and ended up in product. Um, so took a long way to get there, but really enforces the liberal arts education that TUSS provides and just makes you able to really tackle so many different things. So I think I learned a lot from my time at Tufts in terms of entrepreneurial spirit from just um, organizing clubs and doing mentorship programs and learning from a diverse set of areas um, and then taking that to my uh, postgraduate career um, and just really applying that in so many different ways. So. Happy to jump into all of that as we discuss more um, and excited to have a discussion uh, with everyone here today. Awesome, thanks. So we're gonna start with a very juicy question to get the discussion going. Carmichael or DeWick, which we have yet to ask on a panel. So <laughs> this could start a real argument here. DeWick all the way. I lived downhill all four years, so Carmichael was like not even on my radar. <laughs> I might have to yeah. second that and say Duwick. I mean, when you have to get up that hill in the middle of the winter, that's just a no brainer. Um, but I actually met my partner that I'm still together with after seven years at Tufts and she ended up being in Carmichael. So that ended up making that a hard decision for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna go Duwick as well. And it's funny because I actually live in the Hill uh, freshman year. So it, like you would expect that I'd be a car uh, sort of uh, uh, person, but I was just like, I, I, I tried Carm, tried DeWick, and I was just like, yeah, DeWick is it. Um, and I can go into a longer spiel of, of the specifics of why DeWick is it, but there is no question that DeWick is obviously better than Carm for me. <laughs> um, I guess I'll be the dissenter and I'll go for Carm Michael, um, mainly just because I live, I also live in Hill Hall freshman year. Um, and I just, I know, sentimental first year dining hall experiences, and I just have to commit to Mark Carm Michael. Yeah. I'll dissent with you, don't worry. Yeah. Um, awesome, thanks for indulging that. Um, so you guys each talked a little bit about your Tufts experience um, and how it shaped kind of what you do today and how you think about entrepreneurship. But um, 
I'd love to just kind of go back in time and ask you about like, how did you feel arriving at Tufts for the first time? Um, so I, I guess I can go first. Um, for me, it's not so much going back in time, given that it was only four years ago. Um, but arriving at Tufts, I mean, as a sort of a first gen immigrant uh, to the US, I think like I was just sort of taken aback by how wonderful the campus was, how gorgeous it was. Um, I mean, obviously over time, as I got to know more about Tufts, I, I grew to despise the hills. Um, just like walking up and, up and down those hills was just not it. Um, but I think coming to Tufts, I just, I think it was the first time I ever got to meet a, a sort of large group of people that shared my sort of uh, interest or just like learning and pursuing things that I was interested in. And I think that sort of atmosphere and that drive existing in that space for four years, I think really helped shape who I am today, where I, I think I, I have a sort of particular ability to just go for what I want. And I think it's just because I existed around so many people who, who sort of shared that drive and who shared that ability, just like shooting for the stars and doing what they wanted. Um, so coming to Tufts, I uh, didn't really know what to expect, ended up loving it, still love it. Obviously, have a couple of misgivings here and there, but overall, I had a great time. We'll get you a, a graduation ceremony one of these days, Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank I guess I'll go next. And I guess I'll go next. I remember, um, and it's beautiful to hear, by the way, that what you're doing has some sort of Ghana base because my dad's actually from Ghana, West Africa, and so much of my family um, is over there. But I remember uh, one of the first conversations and first experiences that I had at Tufts was actually walking through there with my dad and like having that string of like processing being not only like an immigrant kid, but then also an African-American and then processing what that actually meant to be on the campus. Uh, but I mean, on a, on a lighter note, the hills, I remember that so clearly, having to get up and down on those, especially during the winter. Um, and something that I think was a pretty special experience was just having the opportunity to be able to find other people who were thinking critically about some of the things that were top of mind for me as well. Like whether that ended up being about comparative politics, right, thinking about other countries and how they're actually working into, into what's, what's going on in the world or even whether it ended up thinking about entrepreneurship. I remember within a few weeks was able to find some of the, some of the people that helped me start our first venture um, during our freshman year. And they ended up actually all being in my hall. So that was a special time. Awesome. Gazi Rakua, anything to add? Yeah, I would add that I felt like the Africana Center did a really good job of um, sort of welcoming the Black community to Tufts. Um, I don't know if they still do this, but they had a trip to Cape Cod um, where they kind of took a couple of, you know, people who wanted to sign up who were African American to Cape Cod for a weekend to just sort of bond with just our demographic of people. And I just thought that that was like very thoughtful and also just allowed us to come onto campus and automatically have someone we can lean on you know, even though if we ended up going on our own paths, meeting other people, you know, once we were back on campus. So I just remember that being a very fond memory um, and just a nice introduction to coming to college. That's lovely. I didn't know that. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, I think also just, I think coming on campus was exhilarating just all kinds of new people that you had a chance to interact with. Um, came from a pretty small town and was just excited to see like, people from all over the world and have different opinions and just being able to connect in that way. Um, definitely made friends, I think, in the first week there that I'm still really close with and have really inspired me throughout the years. Um, and so I think just like, I still just remember that like exhilaration and that like energy of getting on campus and like wondering what the hell or what the heck was going to happen. And so it was just pretty, um, still remember that feeling. So excited to see how we've all evolved since then. Awesome. Um, my next question, you guys, I think each of you actually touched upon it um, in a fairly robust way, but just to, to recap it, and if there's anything you want to add, uh, what about your experience at Tufts did and did not prepare you for your career in technology and entrepreneurship, or your career in general, because Guzzi, you were in education before you were in technology, a career you in finance before, so yeah, just I'm, from a broad perspective even. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start there. I think it was just, um, I think so much of what you think about at Tufts is amazing. Like there's so much thought going on, there are projects, there are clubs, but I think like getting into education right after um, and getting teaching in Baltimore right after um, being in Tufts was like a rude awakening in terms of like how um, you need to think about the world and how you want to just like actually take a responsibility for your actions and realize um, how different everyone's experiences are. Um, I think that was, I don't think I was quite prepared. I was like, remember my first year of teaching just wishing I could be in finals again. I was like, I'll do anything to like, go back and like think critically and like have people test me on it. Um, there's a lot more responsibility out here. Um, and a lot you have to think about in terms of not just, just having good intention, but having good actions and how they actually affect the world. So. Yeah, I would piggyback on that. Like, I think I learned a lot at Tufts for sure. Um, but I can't pinpoint anything specifically that has prepared me for a world at Google or, you know, building a, a skincare business. Um, the only thing I would maybe say is like collaborative learning and being able to flex across different, um, you know, pieces of education. So understanding, like having that liberal arts background and being able to take that um, and being able to learn so many different things and needing to like be an entrepreneur has a lot of, I think, comparisons. But I honestly think like you have to just jump into the real world and you, and you kind of learn by doing. And, um, you know, I love my experience at Tufts, but maybe to be a little contrarian, I don't know if it's super prepared me for where I am today. Yeah, I think I would plus one um, a lot of what you just shared there, right? Like when we're thinking about the liberal arts experience and how that translates over into a direct venture or business environment, sometimes it's a little bit challenging to necessarily see the string that, that connects it all. Um, during my experience, both with you know the first startup during Tufts and then some of the other things that I worked on um, with finance on Wall Street over a summer, I remember distinctly coming to a moment where I was like, if I want to do startups and I want to be an entrepreneur, how does liberal arts connect over to that? Um, and that was, that was a challenging experience to see, but as I continued to go through my process of thinking about emerging technologies, both at Uber as we were focused on autonomous trucks, and then even now as we're focusing on autonomous aircraft and autonomous logistics, I started to realize that being able to string together points that don't necessarily connect immediately from different sectors ends up being one of the most pivotal things that I can do to be able to make a robust argument about what the future is going to look like, especially when there's not a clear blueprint on what the future is set to be in some of these markets. And so my political theory and I think philosophy scenarios where you're just sitting at a round table and debating and coming up with constructive arguments over complex pieces of information has actually been pretty useful for whenever you're sitting down with other people and trying to innovate around what the world's gonna end up looking like at some point. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I think for me, I don't know that there's anything that really could have really prepared me to be sort of a first time founder at like point two. Um, I think like raising money, hiring and firing, pivoting, all these things that I and my team sort of um, have had to figure out uh, as sort of first time founders out of college, I, I don't think that we're necessarily prepared for what that might look like. I think Tufts does a really good job uh, through like the career services, the career center, uh, the, the sort of um, the career day they hold. I think they do a good job sort of connecting students to like job opportunities I share out of college, but I don't think that I necessarily found uh, that sort of, uh, I guess, uh, super, maybe education support or just insight into like, oh, if you're building like a SaaS company and selling to like, these like antiquated organizations that have like long sales cycles this is what life will look like because you're going to spend like nine months trying to sell um or close one client while like you're living off of, like two dollars in the company bank account um so i think for me that's like been the biggest uh i, I think uh thing that i wish i knew leading tough is just like what is life like as a first-time staff founder when people sort of think that you're 22 and don't really know what you're doing um just trying to navigate that journey and trying to succeed in this space that's necessarily sort of sort of uh set up for young people, for black people. Um, I think that for me is just like the biggest gap in what I learned at Tufts versus what my lived experience uh, sort of uh, post-grad looks like. Awesome, yeah, that makes sense. 
I want to transition to some kind of career and like key to success questions. I'm actually going to jump down to one about mentorship because I think that um, is very, you know, integral to a career success, especially in a post-university setting. And, you know, Timmy, those, those are the kind of people that you tend to learn some of those, you know, harder lessons about entrepreneurship and just work from. So do any of you guys have a mentor or have had a mentor at some point or are looking for a mentor that has been really helpful um, in your journey? Yeah, I think for me, just like absolutely. Um, I think probably one of the, one of the secret skills, and I don't know how I learned this, but one, one skill that I think I picked up fairly early in my tough career was just like go on LinkedIn and just ping people and say, hey, I'm doing this stuff. I want advice. I want your help. Help me out, please, because I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I think that is one thing that's served me well um, with, with WorkSense right now. I mean, our first term sheet that we closed came from like a cold, like a person I reached out to cold uh, on LinkedIn who connected me to somebody of his that he worked on a company with before who we were building and ended up putting a check-in. And so, I mean, he's been super helpful as a mentor, as like someone who's opened up his network. Um, he's like sold a bunch of companies in the data analytics space. And so for us thinking about uh, the work we do with a lot of sensitive uh, employee data, when you think about how do we get companies to feel comfortable giving us their data, he just has all the experience that we, we just have no idea, uh, we would have had no idea how to navigate things like stop to compliance for data, keeping data secure, um, sort of trying to navigate these long enterprise sales cycles. I think for me, mentorship has been absolutely helpful, um, especially coming into this space. Um, as a founder fairly young uh, and early on in my career, I don't know that I would be as far along as I have been or as I am without sort of that support and that mentorship that I've been able to get just from just like reaching out to people on, uh, on LinkedIn. And I think um, even just, I mean, I've reached out to people who don't necessarily have a Tufts affiliation, but I think one thing that I found recently um, that I've been doing a lot of is just like going to the Tufts alumni page on LinkedIn and just like pinging people on and saying, hey, I'm doing this stuff. I need your help. What advice do you have? And I think I'm starting to see a lot of results and a lot of positive outcomes from that. And I think that's one thing I've stressed a lot is anything in the entrepreneurship journey is hard enough as it is that trying to do it on your own is almost like shooting yourself in the foot. And so that's sort of the one thing that, that has worked for me is just like being very aggressive about reaching out to people, asking for mentorship, asking for support, asking for guidance, because I mean, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel if people already have gone through this experience that and have made some mistakes that you can possibly avoid. You might be a little ahead of most of us at 22, just saying, right? That is, that's awesome. Appreciate it. Anyone else have a good mentorship? Story? Yeah, I can jump in from the, the corporate side. So I've only worked at big corporations aside from my skincare business. Um, you know, I've worked at Bank of America, American Express, and now Google. And I think when you're at a big corporation, it is absolutely critical to have a mentor because you need to be able to bounce ideas off of people who are not in your direct reporting chain um, and trust in those people that they're going to give you the, the right advice to help um, navigate your career. Um, I do think that you have to come to them with very set agendas. So, you know, I set monthly meetings with my mentor. I have an agenda that I, that I run through every month. I send it in advance. I'm super prepared because you wanna come with, um, you know, questions to guide conversations and less so like open-ended, how can you help me? Um, and so, yeah, I would say mentors are critical and um, I found them very valuable in my career so far. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree. And, you know, from, from the things that I've experienced both from entrepreneurship, so really focusing on developing businesses within broader companies um, and then also, you know, going out and focusing on building a traditionally VC-backed company. Both of those situations are um, scenarios where somebody has had a lot more experience um, to think critically about them. And so spending time with them um, does end up helping me avoid a lot, of, a lot of things. One of the things that I have also noticed is obviously the Tufts network is, is phenomenal, but I've noticed that a lot of my mentors have also come now from the Valley and then, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's similar with you for Google, but for me with Uber, a lot of the early Uber employees have really wrapped their arms around me to help me think critically about how do you build a company um, in the fastest way possible while also avoiding some of the pitfalls that they might have had in their experiences. And then those groups also can end up turning into, you know, some, some level of also support when I'm thinking about financial investments into a broader company. 
Um, but I think there's one side of it um, where, you know, you're thinking about mentorship up, but I think there's also another beautiful opportunity when groups are able to also reach out and be able to share some of that. And that's why I'm really happy that we're even able to have these conversations. And it's always an open-ended invitation to anybody that's listening in if they ever want to touch base about what the next chapter is going to be. Love that. Yeah, I would also echo a lot of what everyone said here. I think having mentors and advocates in your work industry is really critical. I think um, formally you want to be prepared, but also like not to underestimate the soft pieces as well. Like I've had conversations with people on the train that have escalated to like them backing me when I want need a promotion um, or just being able to really like get, touch base with someone on a more personal level leading to a, um, a business connection down the road. Um, so I would definitely take advantage of those as well. I think also when pivoting careers, um, it's really essential for me, especially going from education technology, like having people who understand your skill set um, and who really will take the time to understand and think with you and talk to you about how you're changing um, and a lot of connections that you make through different people who have a reputation of who you are. I think Akua helped me when I was going to business school and she lended some of her connections my way. So um, there's all kinds of connections out there. And I think just making sure you're on everyday basis being like a good citizen so that when you do need help, people remember and recognize that. Awesome, that's good advice. Do you guys have thus far a really great highlight in your career that you'd like to share or something you're really proud of? I think I'll, I'll go quickly and it's, it's one that, you know, even though I've been fortunate enough to, to be able to do some things over at Uber and then, you know, are building the business that I am right now, I would say that honestly, the highlight of my career was whenever I was initially starting the venture my freshman year and essentially we were focused on centralizing events on campus and then creating a localized opportunity for restaurants and and other um, portions outside of the initial campus to be able to connect with students. And I remember the first time after pitching to like over a hundred restaurants, just getting one of them to say yes and getting our first check in the bank for that. And uh, I don't know if anything else is ever gonna eclipse that for me and some of the other people that I was doing that with at Tufts. But that is, I think by far, uh, one of the most exciting things that I still look back to. I bet that felt good. I would jump in and say, like, just launching a business is a career highlight for me. I think it's so hard to actually just take an idea and execute it. Um, and I think being able to do that, you know, while still maintaining a career in corporate has been a highlight for me. And also just being able to see the growth and success of the business. And that, you know, it's a skincare brand, so we get like real customer feedback that people love it just keeps me going. And, you know, there are times where you want to throw in the towel, but then you get that feedback and you're like, I got to keep this business going because people love what we do and um, just have to keep, keep it going. So that's been my career highlight to share. Just that, you know, if you have an idea, just start somewhere and um, see where it takes you. Yeah, I think um, one of my first highlights was just, um, when I worked in education, um, it was more on the nonprofit startup kind of side and um, getting to start the first school I worked on with the team in DC um, from like not from application to actually opening the doors of the school. Um, it was like my first taste of like, if you come up with an idea and you like put the work in and execute on it, like what is possible. Um, it was just a crazy timeline. It was a crazy team effort. I think that first taste of like, you can create things um, that didn't exist before. Um, it was really just one of my first clear highlights and it's just kind of given me the inspiration to keep going when things don't seem to necessarily line up. Um, and, but I believe that they're possible. That's awesome. Yeah, Sydney, I bet you me... have something to share, even though you're <laughs> new to this real world stuff. <laughs> Uh, so mine is uh, sort of fairly recent. Uh, for me, the, I think there's very few things um, across my professional career that felt as sort of good as getting our first sort of term sheet at uh, WorkSense. 
Um, I mean, we've, my team and I have been at this game for like three years now, building, talking to people, trying to sell, trying to get investors in and getting that first investor to say, hey, I believe in what you're doing. Here's a check. Um, I think it was just like, it felt different. Um, going to sleep felt different. Waking up felt different. Working on the business felt different. Everything felt different. Um, and I think that, that th there's very few things that, that can help uh, as an entrepreneur to keep pushing and then to have someone give you a vote of confidence in real dollars. Um, and I think for me, that was just, that's been the biggest career highlight for me is just like getting that investor to give us our first check, especially given that, I mean, it, it's all, it's all sort of a, a, uh, a, a I'm going to say investors are lending to, to a degree, right? So it's like getting that first check is now led to a couple of effects that we're starting to see now. And so really, I think that for me is, is easily the highlight of getting that first uh, term sheet. Awesome. Yeah, that's huge. I, any entrepreneur I think would be over the moon there. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. So we're getting a ton of audience questions, which is great. So I'm going to go ahead and, and shift focus and, and go into those a little bit. Um, and I think the first one I want to discuss um, is related to, you know, your racial identity, which is something that we, part of the discussion that we wanted to cover today. So um, I see a question here that is, what are some of the challenges that you face as a Black entrepreneur or technologist? And how have you overcome them? Any advice for other Black entrepreneurs out there? I mean, I think in terms of advice, um, I, I think the one thing I will say is like, there, there's as much as there is room for improvement, I don't think that there's ever been a better time to be a Black entrepreneur. I think right now the community is really rallying around uh, sort of Black founders, Black investors, just anyone Black in that entire venture landscape and entrepreneurship landscape that I think really if you have anything that you want to launch, um, there's never been a time, a better time historically than now to launch uh, a company, a firm, whatever it is in the entrepreneurial space. Um, and then in terms of just like what, what, what sort of life has been as a Black founder, I think really the, the one word I could use to describe it is just underestimated. Um, I think a lot of the times when you walk in the room, being a, a lot of the times when you go to pitch competitions, you're typically the only person of color in the room. Uh, I mean, for me, it's become something that I, it's not surprising anymore to be the only person of color in the room because it just happens so consistently. And I think really a lot of the times when you come in, I think even just looking at uh, the kinds of questions that you're asked, um, I think the, you start to get a sense of the fact that a lot of people underestimate um, people of color who are founders. And I think um, it's interesting that they do, right? Because I think one thing that people of color have, especially uh, Blacks who are founders, is resilience. And I think that's the one thing that has sort of served me well, especially in my journey, is just being resilient, right? We get knocked down, we get back up. We get knocked down, we get back up. And as an investor, that's what you're looking for in a founder. So it's very interesting that, that we are an underestimated group of people. Um, but I think that for me, that's the one word I used to describe my experience so far as underestimated. But I think um, going back to my first point, really, I think people, more and more people uh, in the broader entrepreneurship landscape are starting to see the real um, the abilities of, of Black founders, the, the things that we bring to the table, the unique perspectives. And I think really there could not be a better time to, to, to kick something off as a, as a person of color, as a Black person who has um, any idea that you think uh, has, has the legs. Awesome. Yeah, I love that, right? Like of all the times where we've had some of the challenges that we've faced with our identity, I think this is the first time that there's been an audience that's broader than a lot of the groups that traditionally are actually challenged themselves within the black community, right? Like there's a number of allies who are starting to educate themselves on their experience and show up to the table with some sort of dialogue to be had that is additive in some way. I would say, you know, I would say one of the core things that I've missed um, through a, a number of my experiences, whether it's, you know, as a full on entrepreneur, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's Wall Street or even where it's right now as on this management team, uh, you know, you're consistently in a scenario where you walk into a room, whether it's a boardroom or investor room or wherever the executive room, and you're typically the only person that looks like yourself. That's taxing in a lot of ways. And I think there's an element W.E.B. Du Bois talks about with double consciousness where you're always aware of, you know, how you're being perceived. Um, but I think one of the broader portions that I've, I've noticed is this almost superhero complex that sometimes ends up happening with, with, um, with people of color and with black people in particular, where oftentimes you're asked to hit goals that are relatively extreme with minimal resources and the reward for you being able to hit those goals is more opportunity to keep working hard of course but 
without necessarily more resources. And so at each stage, it's like you're, you're asked to, you know, build the company, make sure that you stay afloat, even though you don't have a job right now, that's your entire job, hit all these goals, and then you'll be able to get that, you know, that term sheet. You do that for an extended period of time without the generational wealth to be able to back you based on a lot of the things that have happened and, um, you know, in our history. And that's, I think that persists, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether you're on Wall Street, whether it's entrepreneurship, um, and it's taxing, I think, not only on the, bo- on the, on the body, but then also on the mind. And um, that's one other piece that I would just say is, is pretty challenging. But of all times, I think it's beautiful because there's so many people who are now lifting out their hands to, to try and connect and reach out and see how they can be supportive. But that's one thing that I've noticed. Interesting. Yeah, Akua and Gozi, do you have anything to add there? Um, I think for me, definitely feel the underestimated um, in different views. I think currently I am the only black product manager at my organization. Um, So you're often the only one in the room. And then throughout my career, even before getting into tech, I think oftentimes as a black female in the work organization, sometimes you're the first person that that team or that manager has ever worked with who's strictly different from them. Um, And I've having to accommodate their um, feeling uncomfortable to even feeling threatened is something that like I think can make your work dynamic even harder to navigate because you have to accommodate their feelings towards you. Um, And so I think dealing with that and being able to navigate that successfully um, is can become difficult, especially as you're trying to move up in your career um, and trying to advocate for yourself while recognizing that not everyone's ready for you um, and being able to work past that and make that a reality for yourself despite um, others' understanding of who you are and what they expect from you. Mm-hmm. Akua, anything to add or I, I can move on as well. No, I mean, I, I echo everyone's comments um, and agree that there really is not a better time for pushing the diversity conversation in tech and in entrepreneurship. So if these are areas that you wanna get into, know that companies are quite like, like frankly being forced to hire diversity candidates. Um, there's you know, a lot of um, scrutiny on that right now. So you know, it's not, if there's no better time to get involved um, and apply if that's you know, the area that you wanna focus on. Awesome. Um, great. There's a, we have another question, audience question kind of in this same vein. Have you found that more people have reached out to help your business or learn more about what you're doing in recent months, given the recent, recent tragic events our nation has witnessed? Yes. Uh, for Carrie Tay specifically, we were like overwhelmed, inundated with request for samples, all of a sudden retailers who hadn't spoken to us in two years wanted to stock our product. Um, There's definitely a huge emphasis again on, um, you know, carrying black products, black skincare lines, black fashion designers in stores. Um, And it's it's a little bit like interesting and kind of funny, right? Because it's like, hey, we've been here um, you know, we've, we started our business three years ago. We were knocking on these doors. We weren't getting answers. You have to ask yourself why that was the case. Um, but we're also welcoming the attention and um, taking advantage of it. So, you know, I think the conversation's changing for the good. Um, and, you know, we'll see how it persists over time. That's great. I, I, are you optimistic about kind of that change or engagement, I guess? I am. I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm also, I'm like cautiously optimistic, right? Because I, what I worry about is that everyone's excited now. Like, let's see what happens three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. Are we going to continue to have these conversations or is the hype of it going to die down? Um, so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that there's going to be like, you know, sort of change for the good and for the long term, but we'll see. 
Yeah, I would second that, right? It's like before this all happened, we were black. And, you know, after people forget or the energy dies down, we're still black. And um, there's there's an element of like the therapeutic nature of having so many allies now reach out, even though a lot of the sequences that we've experienced within the course of the last couple of months have been going on for such a long period of time. It's just nice now that um, you know, people are able to like sit and think about what they can do to contribute positively to it, as opposed to being distracted with some of the other things that have been, that have consistently made it a little challenging for people to, to, to step up to the, to the plate there. Um, and then on, on my side, you know, aerospace is aerospace. So it's like autonomous um, aircraft and, uh, and the element of not necessarily needing to have any sort of contact between delivery is more of a reflection of what's going on with COVID than I think it is um, everything on the social justice side. But one thing that I have noticed is like, as I start to talk with um, uh, some of our investors and some of the potential investors outside, you know, they're, they're coming with a different lens than what I think I've noticed previously. So it's like, they'll come with the idea of like expecting something beautiful to come out of your mouth, as opposed to this element of sometimes needing to prove that you know what you're talking about. Um, and I'm hoping that that continues to trend. Awesome. Guzzi or Timmy, do you guys want to add anything? We have a, another question. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just to add on to everything that Echo and Kofi both said, um, I, I, I think that caution also is something that I share uh, because a lot of this feels sort of performative to some extent, right? And so uh, I think really for me, at least the name of the game has just been, how do I take advantage of the current state of things as much as I can uh, up until if and when all of this dies down, um, especially I think any, the fact that we got our first term sheet a couple weeks ago, I think it's no surprise that, that happened um, during the time that this conversation was was so high up there in the, in the minds of people. Um, and I think especially with our mission at WorkSense, I mean, our literal mission is driving fairness and equity as PL and tech. And so in terms of attention and, and in terms of, uh, I guess, people reaching out, I think we've seen a lot of uh, increased engagement because people are sort of starting to see the value of what, we, what we've been talking about. I think um, maybe November, December, um, all of these things that we've been saying at WorkSense for, for, for a while now, people are like, oh, that's cool. Um, and now it's like, I need this. Um, and so I think in terms of just like engagement levels, I think it's the, the sort of social uh, climate is definitely, definitely help with that. But I think I do share that caution of a uh, lot well, of this feels sort of performative and I, I, I'm hopeful, um, but, but cautious uh, of, of uh, sort of the uh, sort of positive uh, direction that the conversation is going towards. Um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, in a year or two from now, uh, where, where we, we've been able to maintain the same level of uh, critical uh, conversation and just sort of, uh, uh, I guess, activism regarding the, the topic of diversity inclusion in, in America and also in tech workplaces. Great. Guzzi, do you, because you're in product management, which notoriously is not black, um, and I, I saw that you're part of an organization that kind of helps develop black product managers um, have you seen any kind of like great initiatives or anything you want to share in that vein of how we can get more diverse perspectives in that sector? Yeah, I think there are definitely more initiatives and more um, like grassroots energy around um, black, black product managers and tech who are trying to make sure that they're helping others get into the same position. Um, I think from an organizational standpoint, there's a little bit more clarity around, okay, this is an issue and we do need to get more diverse voices into um, tech. I think there's still so, I mean, the sentiment is there. I think there's still a lot of structural barriers in between um, making that happen. Um, and so I'm hopeful that those will actually, people will start to recognize those and start to do something about them um, to allow people to gain access and um, help them over those barriers. Um, frankly, I haven't quite seen it yet. Um, but I hope it will start to happen um, as people take more action, but these are more of the long-term pieces um, and we will see how they transpire. But yeah, trying to do, I think individuals I've seen definitely stepping up organizations. I'm looking to see what they do. Awesome. We have an audience question that 
this dovetails nicely into um, how do you think technology companies and startups can improve upon retaining black talent and what are common pitfalls you've seen or heard about? Um, so I think for me, I, I have actually, I actually have a lot of thoughts on this just because again of how we think about things that work sense. Um, I think the perspective that we have is that for the longest, when you have a conversation of diversity in tech, everyone's primarily thought about, th thought about it from a pipeline perspective where it's like, oh, we'll just funnel more people of color into the space and we'll be all dandy and wonderful and everything will be fine. But I think the reality is just like, that's not the case. And I think if you look at, for example, studies like uh, the Kapoor Center Tech Libre study, I think it's called, I mean, they interviewed around 2000 people um, from every background in tech and everyone just talked about their crappy experiences in tech and why they quit their jobs because they felt like they were discriminated or they felt that they were dealing with microaggressions at work. And I think really for me, when I think about how do you how do you how do you solve this problem? It's all about creating systemic solutions, right? I think a lot of times there's this huge tendency to to sort of go with the band-aid solutions because they're fairly easy, right? You bring in a consultant, they do a three-day session. Now we care about diversity and inclusion, wonderful, but that's just not a so that that, that doesn't solve the problem, right? Um, and so really, when you think about systemic solutions, I think one of the things, especially um, with how we think about things that work, then it's like, for example, you have a a black employee, they're performing at the same level as everyone else, but they're being underpaid, underpromoted. These are things that will end up booting up and causing a lot of, uh, I think, uh, negative sentiments internally for that employee that will end up leading to a reality where they end up leaving their job or leaving the sector entirely, right? And so when you think about how do you create a, a space that's better suited to to support people of color, better suited to support black people, I think really for me, uh, how we think about that solution is just how do you create this, how do you, how do you create systemic solutions? How do you, how do you take the systems that exist uh, because a lot of the, I think tech has primarily been like a sort of boys club for the longest, right? Where it's like, oh, if I'm boys with my manager, then we'll go get beer after work and I'll tell him that I think I deserve a raise or a bonus. And then when it's, when the promotion cycle or compensation cycle comes around, I'll end up getting that bonus or promotion, right? Whereas say, for example, if I'm like a, I don't know, a black guy or, or, or a black female or I have kids or whatever, uh, I'm not typically the kind of guy that would go to, to the bar with my, with my boss, then I'm, I'm less likely to get, get sort of a fast, fast track for that promotion, for that race, for that bonus. And so really, I think the name of the game is how do you level the playing field? And I think that's where data comes in. Right? I think uh, data, it, it, coming in from a data perspective, it's hard. It's not easy. Um, and I think that's why a lot of organizations shy away from it. And I think that works. And that's what we're trying to do really is make that process of leveraging data to make more fair choices, a bit more seamless for people leaders. And so I think when, it, when, when, I, when I answer the question of how do you make tech a better space for, for minorities, I think for me, the answer is use data because data will show you where you're doing wrong. And I think a lot of the times, right, these, these biases aren't necessarily intentional, right? There's a reason they're called unconscious biases, but how you sort of unearth those unconscious biases is data because data will tell you, hey, we've got this 17% of black employees who are overperforming but underpaid or underpromoted. Now you know exactly what's going on. You can create um, systems that will end up sort of fast tracking those people for promotions or raises or bonuses. And so just a long answer short, really, I think for me, that answer is data helps you create those systemic changes because that is what ends up sort of creating a space that is actually conducive for minorities that they're interested in sitting in that doesn't have them going home crying to their significant other or their family or whatever, um, creating a space that they're, they're happy, they're happy coming back to every day. Um, I think for me, that answer is just data, data, data. Yeah. That's a good answer. I think we need, we need more of that. Any, any other thoughts, Akua, Kofi, or Kazi on that? I, I'm also personally very curious on this, you know, topic as well. Yeah, you know, I think data is phenomenal. I think some of the walls that we've seen to hit when it comes to incorporating data, especially some of the places that I've been where that's such a core portion of their their strategy and everything else, but then maybe lacking in that space. Um, is this like level opportunity to actually be able to have an access to that data? Um, sometimes it can be relatively challenging to be able to get the right level of information um, given the way that things are set up. But I think that would be beautiful, you know, for us to be able to incorporate data the way that we do with so many other portions of, of what we're doing. Um, one of the things that, you know, I've, I've noticed is a lot of times what's happening is the very group that's feeling a pain point or is feeling the challenge is asked to solve that problem. Even though, you know, we didn't create it, right? Like history would show, like there wasn't the way that things were set up. Um, you end up being in a situation where it's like you feel discriminated against, you should fix it, 
or you don't have enough black people at the company that sounds like your problem you should fix it and even though it doesn't the words don't actually come off that way when it comes to the allocation of resources or the allocation of actual workload um, you know it's like we we have full-time careers and jobs that we also have to do and it's a part of our identity from day one and something that i'm sure all of us you know deeply care about and are working towards but one thing that i know we've incorporated me and my management team is making sure that uh, the allies within the within our leadership team are actually the ones driving a lot of that work you know doing 80 90 percent of the work and then asking for that 10 20 percent of feedback so you don't feel paralyzed to say the wrong thing or to do the wrong thing and making sure that it's on the right track right but like having another group actually shoulder a lot of that burden since it's already pretty mentally taxing to continue to walk into each room and be the only minority in that room or it's already mentally taxing to feel some of the some of the you know accidental or incidental you know um scenarios where it's just not the the best experience for you just as a, as a minority and so i think that's something that's hard to to do but something that i feel like is the right step so that it's not just on the people who are feeling the pain yeah yeah the the anecdote I will share about like having a kind of an aha moment in terms of privilege this year, I started the job I'm at now where we, we have a mentorship program that we sell to businesses to elevate diverse leaders. Um, so I went to a um, panel in my first week and this woman who was in the DEI organization at Google was explaining how when she interviews, she's very, very careful not to come off as the angry black woman when she comes out you know, giving feedback about the the candidate, which is for like something I've never thought about. I've definitely come out of an interview with a candidate and probably dropped a curse word or, you know, had a very strong opinion on somebody. And I, it was just light bulbs went off when I realized that she has to go out of her way to, to really censor the way that she comes across. And I had never given it a second thought. So I think that's an interesting, uh, I think that's a really good point that it's like, this is all of our work. Um, we're running a little bit short on time and there's a couple more um, questions just more generally about entrepreneurship and um, just skills. So I wanna get into some of those. How important are soft skills and hard skills in an industry like technology? And since you guys have varied backgrounds, I think you'll have good answers for this question. So in, in my opinion, it's very, um, it differs by role. So I'm in sales. So obviously having like hard technical skills are not critical because we have engineers and product managers who support me to sell the product. Um, so I don't need to be in the weeds of those things. Um, but I also work for a really big company. I think at a smaller company, you might have to be more nimble and um, sort of be more jack of all trades and maybe understand the tech in more detail. Um, that being said, you know, definitely depends on the role. I, at Google, my first role was in programmatic advertising, which is very ad technology driven. And so I actually did need to know, even as a salesperson, quite a bit of the tech because clients would ask me questions specific to that tech. Um, so I think it really just depends on, on the role that you're looking at, the role and the company that you're looking at. Yeah, I would say in product, it's essential to have both. Um, that I need to be able to talk to my engineers. I need to be able to pull data to back the decisions I'm making. Um, I also need to navigate and work with customers and have those soft skills um, to kind of get a sense of like what their problems are and figuring out specific use cases. But then also internally, I have to navigate strategy and try to work with my coworkers and lobby for the strategies I think are gonna really suit my team or the organization. So um, for me, I think they're both super essential. Um, I would say, don't like get too ahead of yourself. If you're not super technical or you need to build your soft skills there's time to develop those especially on the job um i came into tech with zero tech background and have managed to figure it out um but the i think you just gotta like be aware and be conscious of the skills you need to build and ask until 
good questions. Um, and also don't feel embarrassed to ask questions. Um, that's something I really struggled with when trying to get that um, more tech background and get some of those hard skills. Um, so I think don't be afraid, lean in and just be on that journey. Yeah, I love that, right? And I think a big piece of that also comes with the mentorship that we talked about a little bit earlier. Sometimes you just don't know what you don't know, especially coming from a liberal arts background where you may not have specifically been focused on some of the harder skills that you're gonna um, need in order to be successful at your career. Um, for me, um, navigating like kind of running the division for business development and then also strategy, I kind of think about them somewhat in a different fashion. For strategy, there's a lot of the hard skills around like cost modeling and all the things you have to do in order to, to be able to think pretty critically there. But on the BD side, especially as you're raising money or whether you're trying to get a partnership through, if you can, you can do all of the work behind the scenes, but if someone is not enjoying their experience with you um, or if your company is not behind you and what you're trying to do, it's going to be a very taxing um, time. And so they, they go hand in hand. It's very difficult to have one without the other and get too far, especially on the entrepreneurship side. Um, yeah, so just real quick, I think similar to what everyone said, uh, for me at the very least, it's been a bit of both. Um, I mean, I think my role as CEO is just pretty much, I like to describe it as like, I get us money, hire right people and get out of the way so everyone else can get their job done. Um, and so it's very much sort of soft skills. Um, but I do, I will say that like having that CS minor has been helpful when I have conversations with my CTO where I have reasonable expectations of how long it can take for us to ship a particular product feature, um, whether or not we need someone else to come on board to, to, to support us technically to build some other feature and just having uh, reasonable expectations. I think um, you can definitely sort of go far with soft skills, um, but uh, hard skills definitely don't hurt is my opinion. Nice. Um, we're going to have to wrap up here. So we'll make this our last question. What advice would you have for those of us who want to be engaged in startups or entrepreneurship, but don't necessarily have an original idea to execute? Are there roles you would suggest for capable behind the scenes people? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say really just, just find someone that you believe in and just stick with them. Um, I think that that's the sort of advice I would give. I think really, if you're interested in that sort of, um, uh, I think, entrepreneurial journey, I think really it's all about being able to work very well with who you're working with. Um, I mean, in my, in my sort of journey, I've had like, I think up to 34 co-founders so far. I think really what's, what's sort of uh, set uh, the good ones apart from the bad ones are that I just had very great working relationships with the ones that, that, that ended up being great working relationships um, and whether or not they, they were maybe the best uh, skills wise, um, I think was less important than do we work well together. Um, and so I, I would recommend just like find someone that you work well together with and just say, listen, how can I be helpful? What, what skill sets do I have that can move the needle forward? And then as the company grows, as whatever idea you're working on grows, you'll obviously round out the team a bit more. You obviously find where you're, where your skill, where, where you're, where you're most uh, able to contribute. But I think really you should be more focused on finding someone that you work well with, that you believe in, that you think can go to distance um, with whatever it is they're working on. I think that's more important uh, than anything, especially, um, at the earliest stage of things versus like finding an idea that you're particularly passionate about, especially if you're not necessarily um, founder level. I think it's just, do you love working with those people? Or are they a team that you enjoy spending time with? Cause like, I will tell you, spend all your time with those people. Um, so just making sure that like you're comfortable with those people and you can spend time with them and you enjoy working with them. I think is what I would advise. Just find those kinds of people and just stick with them essentially. Cause eventually you'll find something that sticks and you essentially be on something that's essentially an amazing journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that startups are always looking for freelancers. Um, so you could um, use one of those freelance sites to put up a profile with your skill set, whether it's just like general consulting or, you know, whatever you have to offer. And then you could work with the startups, just understand how they operate um, just to get that experience so that you can then figure out, is this something that you would want to do on your own? Um, so yeah, and you never know, maybe they want to hire you full time if you do an awesome job. So um, that would be another way to just get some experience and, and exposure with startups. Yeah, and um, on my side, you know, I would probably think about two or three things. One of them is understanding what stage of the company you actually want to be at. Um, obviously, if you do want to be at a startup, there's, you know, the very early seed and angel side. There's also ones that are further ahead with the series A and series B. But 
each one of those profiles can actually make you have a different set of skills that are going to be more or less helpful for you. And then in terms of finding something that actually is meaningful to you, um, I know that a lot of the groups at Tufts who come out care a good amount about social impact. And so if you can just figure out what industries or what problems are actually going to be, able, be meaningful for a number of communities out there, I think that should hopefully get you started in a way that at least you won't be regretting the spot that you went to. And then the third one is just seconding every, everything everyone else said, right? Like if you, you're going to spend a lot of time with the people. So um, vetting that it's going to be a big, big piece of that as well. Yeah, I think I'd echo a lot of what people said here. I think particularly for me, um, starting out my career in a growing um, company was great for not being sure like what I want to do, but being part of something that's growing, you get a lot of responsibility quickly. Um, you get projects maybe you're not ready for, but I have to figure out. And I think that can be a great way to test your skills in terms of like, I have to come up with a solution, I have to be creative, I have to get this done. Um, otherwise, I would promote product. I think it's a quick, good way to kind of like get that maker mentality in terms of like, this is an idea and I have to figure out how to execute on it. Um, and I think that's a just a good mentality to start developing um, if you want to be an entrepreneur and start getting your ideas out there. Awesome. That is excellent advice. And being mostly at startups in my career, I can echo all those things. I can't thank you guys enough for sharing your experience and just talking with us and talking about what you're doing and all the great stuff. Um, I hope we hear more from you guys. And I encourage any of the um, attendees tonight to connect with our panelists if you have any you know, follow-up questions. Um, they're all doing really great stuff and are great resources. I'll leave you with our next event, which is Monday, August 24th at 6 p.m. Eastern for a session on radical innovation, audacious entrepreneurial thinking. So we'll be talking about the role of mindset, risk, and technology in addressing huge problems and market opportunities. Hear how widely successful companies marry complex research with the speed of a startup and review the skills, relationships, and tools needed to build a minimum viable product, acquire customers, and scale. Have a lovely evening, everybody.